Okay, uh, good, good afternoon everyone. Just one thing that I'm curious, why this college called Long Island University if it's in Brooklyn? Anybody knows the answer? It's, a, it's an extension. Ah, it's an extension. So there is an original... Where in Long Island? Long Island doesn't make enough money, so they, may, they send one to Brooklyn. That's, that's, that's not the best location for college, so difficult to get here. All right, anyway, so I was asked to speak about life after death. And obviously, this is a very interesting topic. Everybody likes it. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or not. People are always curious to know what's going to happen in the time of death. For those who do not know me yet, all my lectures, with no exception, are always based on scientific evidence, which means everything I finally say, nobody can argue. Why? Because it's scientifically proven. Now, there's two different kinds of science, objective science and speculative science. Speculative science, it's endless. You can make speculations forever, and you can argue forever, and you never really reach a final result. But objective science, it's like math. Two and two, it's four. That's it. The argument is over. Everything I speak about, first I see what the non-Jewish scientists, some of them are Jewish, it doesn't really matter, what the non-religious scientists found, objectively, and then I go 3,000 years into the time of the Torah and show that the Torah already saw everything coming, the Torah already spoke about it, like uh, things like vaccines, and the number of the animals that are exceptional in the entire universe, the number of the galaxies, the number of the stars. I gave you a very, very interesting DVD. It's free of charge. Nice Jews are donating these DVDs and they're doing the job. Basically, every Jew that is serious and asking questions about life, what life is all about, who is the creator, what did he create us for, what is this world is all about, so many people, different races, different species, animals, galaxies, oxygen, water, so many questions about the creation. Obviously, people that are clever, it bothers them. A person that is not such a, an intelligent human being, he doesn't pay so much attention to what's going on around him. But every person that is intelligent, it must bother him, bother him daily, what am I doing in this huge creation? My creator, is he made me, and obviously every creation has a purpose. It's impossible to think that I'm going to live here 70, 80 years not knowing my purpose, not knowing my destination. Where, do I, where, where am I he heading to? What is uh, the purpose of my life? Maybe every second of my life is a mistake. Now, those, these questions can be answered. Or it's going to stay a myth forever. We're going to live and we're going to die and we'll never find the answer. So the answers, and I promise you, when I say guarantee, trust me that I'm not exaggerating, it's inside this DVD. It's a long DVD. It's divided to three different sessions, part one, two, and three. If you don't have patience to see three hours and 20 minutes straight, then you watch one hour and another hour and another hour. Different dates, it's fine. But you, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself because you're going to get a lot of answers to many, many questions that I'm sure you ask in your life. And it's all proven scientifically. Now remember, every religious person, Jew, non-Jew, can come and make up all kinds of beautiful lectures. Can he prove what he say or it's based on believing? For instance, Christians in a Christian church their concept is spiritual thing cannot be proven. You have to believe. We have no, no, we don't have any reason to waste time and to try to prove to you what we say. You believe it, fine. You don't believe it, it's your problem. That's their answer when you begin to investigate what they preach. In Judaism, it's exactly the opposite. It's your obligation to investigate, to ask as many questions as you have, and until you get the final answers and you are 100% sure, then you move into actions. If you see doubts or contradiction or one mistake in one of the 24 books of Judaism, then for you, it's nothing. It's just a piece of paper. Why? If it's divine, 
You should not have any mistake. Once we find one mistake in the Torah or in the prophets, that means we cannot rely on what we call Judaism. But just for those who don't know, obviously for 3,320 years, millions of philosophers and very intelligent, smart people were doing everything they can to try to find mistakes in the Torah. The more we live, the more we see the brilliance of the Torah. For instance, just in the last 20 years, we discovered so many things in the Torah that we couldn't see before because we never had computers. With the help of the computer, we're finding equal mathematical skips in the text that leaves no doubt that this is a divine origin book. No human being was able to hide such so many millions of different codes in equal mathematical skip inside the text. Shows in America on public television, like 60, 60, 60 or 60 Minutes, I'm not so familiar with their names, but very famous shows on prime time that broadcast to millions of Americans, they already show the codes in the Torah. And there's a very famous book, Codes in the Torah, that even the scientists came to the conclusion, they checked the book of Genesis, Bereshit. This book could never be written by a human being. Okay, now when the food came, so we can start. <laughs> very good. Thank you, very good. All right. So now, as I said before, I'm going to focus this lecture, Life After Life, Life After Death, depending how you want to call it, it's a very long lecture. Even though it's very, very interesting lecture, we don't have the time to finish it. I'm going to have to skip half of it. If you want to, oh, wow, you prepared it for 200 people. <laughs> That's what you really expected? Yeah, very good. Uh, wow. All right. Interesting. So, like I said, this is a very long lecture, but we don't have the time, so I'm going to give half of it. And if you want to find the full version of that, divineinformation.com. That's my website. I, you have my website on the on the DVDs, plus you have my cards here, you can go into the website, you have about 400 different topics, 400 different lectures, and I'm sure you're going to find a lot of interesting things in the website. With the help of God, when we started the website, we only had not even 100 people in the first month, is when we started. Today we have more than 30,000 viewers every month, and it's growing by the minute. And I had more than a hundred Christians who converted already, or in the process of converting, after they watched my famous debate with the, with the priest, with the Christian professor. They showed that Christianity, with all their glory and fame, they don't have anything to offer. It's full of mistakes and full of contradictions in every chapter in Christianity. And many of them just left the church, among them two priests. They already left, one in Florida and another one, one Muslim guy in Pakistan, lives in the heart of the terrorism city, right there, is planning to leave Pakistan to go to India to convert and go quietly back <laughs> and be an undercover Jew. Why? Believe it or not, some people are clever enough to know that life is too short to miss the target. What are we living for? Okay, let's move on. Uh, Everything I'm going to show you, it's a combination of Torah and science. A part of what I'm going to speak about comes from the scientific world, which means parapsychologist. All the names you're going to see in this lecture are the most famous parapsychologists in the world. Not only in America, in the world. Which means everyone in psychology, every psychiatrist, which means parapsychologist, they mean they investigate what comes after life. This is the top names in the entire world. And, of course, the Torah, I don't have to present the Torah to you. We're talking 3,320 years ago. Approximately 15 million Jews, which were Hebrews until that day, received the Torah in a public event. This is the only religion in history that was given in front of millions of witnesses. All the other religions that came after Judaism 
among them Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, it's all a story of one person. Never brought one witness to his story. So it started right away with 50% doubt because I can tell you whatever I want. Now you have to choose if you want to believe me or not. And that's the difference between Judaism, which is the first religion, to all the ones that came after. How many religions followed us? Who knows? More than 80,000 religions and cults. Just in the United States alone, you have more than 10,000 religions and cults. And that shows you, if you're intelligent enough, that it's all baloney. Every week, somebody making up a new religion. To make a religion and find 10 people to follow you, and 100 years later, it becomes a few thousand or a few millions, it's not the hardest things in the world, especially when your religion is very easy to practice. Very easy. Christianity, for instance, almost everything is allowed. Why shouldn't we be religious? Almost everything is allowed. You eat whatever you want, you do whatever you want, you don't have hardly any restrictions. Islam, it's a much harder religion to keep. But how Islam started? With a sword. People who did not want to become Muslim, they paid with their life. So this is just to give you an idea what we're talking about. Okay, let, let's move on. We, when we review the Torah, the Torah says, Vaitzer Hashem Elohim, and God created Adam, sand from the ground, and he blew into his nostrils a living soul. Three steps in the creation of man. First, God created a body. How the body was made? Material, sand from the ground. After the body was made, what keeps all the molecules, all the mi minerals, the iron, the salt, the liquids that we have in our body, what keeps it all together? The soul that he blew into the nostrils of that body. Which means, try to imagine a dead body, you take such a divine energy that called a soul, you're able to blow it into the nostril of this body, and at that second what happened to the person? He gets up and he begins to talk and to function. What's death according to the Torah? And the body returned into the ground as it was before. And the spirit will return to God because he is the one who gave it. So a reverse transaction. The, body, the spirits leave the body. The body falls to the ground. What happened to the body a month later? Disappeared. There's nothing left. That's life and death. We go into the oral Torah. For those who do not know what does it mean, oral Torah, the Torah is a combination of written and oral laws. The written laws are very, very brief, short. There is no explanation how to fulfill one mitzvah in a written law. All the explanation how to do the laws comes in the oral laws, which were transferred from father to son verbally. Comes the oral Torah, thank you, comes the oral Torah and says, Three partners, three partners in a creation of men. God, his father, and his mother. Please try to concentrate on me and not on the Coca-Cola. <laughs> Coca-Cola, you have all year around, and the cold cuts. Here, it's once in a lifetime opportunity. So, don't miss it. So, three partners in a creation of men. God, his father, and his mother, three partners. The father gives, contributes the, the bones, the ligaments, the nails, the brain inside the head, the white inside the eyes, and the mother gives the skin, the flesh, the, the air, the pupils inside the eyes, and God gives the spirit, the soul, the image of the face, the ability to see, the ability to hear, the ability to walk, wisdom, intelligence, and once the time for a person arrives to leave this world, that means the soul has to separate from the body and goes back to the upper world, spiritual worlds, what happened to the person? Comes God and take his share. 
and leave only what the mother and father contributed, which means you cannot walk, you cannot hear, you cannot do anything. He took all the spiritual parts of the creation, what we call human being. The Torah says, first we should know that there are 613 laws to keep. In today's generation, we hardly have a hundred to keep. Why? We got a very, very serious discount. Why we got a discount? Because we don't have the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. Most of the laws somehow connects to Jerusalem, to the Temple, to the Kohanim, to the Levites, to sacrifices, to 10% of your wheat, your barley, the farmers, slaughtering animals. Some of the laws apply only to boss. Some of them apply to men only, and some apply to ladies only. Some of them only apply to a judge. Some of them only apply to a doctor. So, in that case, an average human being, how many laws he has to keep in an entire year? Not even a hundred, approximately. Three out of the 613 original laws that were given are telling the person that is not allowed to communicate with the deceased people. Just before I'm going further to explain, I want each one of us to understand why God gave us, the Jews, 613 laws. The answer is, the body of the human being is a combination of 248 parts, organs, 365 ligaments. For every organ in a body, we have a positive mitzvah that you have to fulfill it in order for you to inherit the reward for that mitzvah. Every ligament in the body has a restriction in the Torah. So let's calculate. 248 organs, 248 positive mitzvot. 365 ligaments, 365 restriction. Every ligament connects to one restriction in the Torah. The Torah says in the Kabbalah that first came the Torah and then came the world. The Torah was prepared, it's like the blueprint of the creation. And God looked into his Torah and based on the Torah he created the creation. The major part of the creation is us, the human being. So since the Torah had 613 laws. He made us with 613 laws. Three out of the 613 laws, three out of the 365 restrictions, which I just mentioned, three of them is you should not communicate with the deceased people. Don't ask questions from the dead bodies. Now, every, every fool knows that if you have a dead body, it's not going to tell you the weather tomorrow. <laughs> what is it? What? I need the Torah from you, God, to tell me that I cannot ask questions from the dead bodies. Come on. But on second thought, if God bothered to make his Torah include three restrictions that we should not communicate with the dead body, three different methods, it's an integral part of the Torah. That means the problem is by me, not by the Torah. That means I, have no, I don't know yet that there is a way to communicate with the dead people. The fact that I see a dead body and obviously I cannot speak to him doesn't mean that the real person, which is the soul, died also. Where is Albert Einstein after he died? Is he in the grave or he is somewhere? That's the answer. That's the question. When the Albert Einstein died, everybody was searching for his intelligence. They checked his body. Where is all the knowledge? Where is it? In the blood? In the veins? In the bones? Where is In the water? In the stomach? Where exactly is all the intelligence? Computer, you know, you take the hard drive. That's the knowledge right here. But by human being, where is the intelligence? Better, soon I'm going to show you how people die and come back to life. When they are dead, they cannot answer one simple question. When they come back to life, all of a sudden, all the information returns. Where was it in these 10 minutes that this body was dead? Where was it? 
we're going to prove it soon. So three different ways not to disturb, not to disturb the dead bodies. And obviously, obviously the, the, the Torah wouldn't bother giving us three restrictions unless if it's possible. Then in the book of Eov, the Torah says, the prophet Eov says, my, my body, my body and my flesh and my bones and ligaments are my alphabet. So who am I? The flesh, the skin, the bones and the ligaments, this is my alphabet, my suit. So who am I? What's left? So obviously this is only the cover. The body is only the cover. Then we continue in the book of Isaiah 2. Mina Adam Asher Neshama Be'apo From a human being that has a soul in his nostrils. That's another source. We'll continue. The Torah say when Rachel, the wife of Jacob, died, just before she died, the Torah say, and the soul of Rachel came out of her body, and then Rachel died. So obviously, in many, many places, death is the soul leaving the physical body. The body is always dead. It's like an envelope. You have a, you have a diamond and you have a plastic box. Everybody understands the diamond inside the box. That's what's important. The box is only a dollar. It's nothing. Once the diamond is in the box, the box is worth something. People pay attention to it. Once the diamond is out of the box, who cares about the box? Okay, so let's move on. The Torah says every baby in the nine months that is in his mother womb is able spiritually to view the entire world, spiritually. And there's an angel who teaches him the entire Torah, everything. And once the time for him to come out arrives, the angel taps him on his top lips and he forgets everything. What, what is this? This is all spiritual. We don't understand how it works exactly. And we're going to see now some of the things, as I told you, I must keep in order for me to try to cover most of this lecture. Okay, so now there are five different topics in this lecture. One is out-of-body experience. People who died and came back to life, what happened to them in these 10, 20, 30 minutes that they were completely dead according to the law of medicine, and what they were able to report when they returned to life. Seance, which means connecting, communicating with dead people through a middleman, a medium, and different ways. <coughs> Reincarnations, scientific evidence that people actually returning in different lifetimes, in different bodies, who? The same soul. One soul can come to this world five, ten, twenty, or a hundred times even. There are many reasons for that. I obviously, I didn't, come to, I didn't come to teach you the entire Torah tonight. But it's a fact today, without any doubt, soon you're going to see the proofs, that we are here not for the first time. So, for instance, if your name in this life is Joseph, it could be eight years ago, it used to be Isaac, in a different body. Interesting, I saw a list of very famous people in the world that used to remember their previous life, and the picture of their body from their previous life is very similar to the picture of the body in their next life. It's interesting. Plus, birthmark in some people's body are indication how these people used to get, how they got killed. For instance, somebody that has a scar in his heart, he remembers in his previous life his, his competition across the street stabbed him with a knife in his heart. And from his previous life, that's where he got stabbed, that's where he have a birthmark in his body in the next life. And many other examples like this. I'll see how much time I'm going to have to show these interviews, but we'll see. Then we have regression. Hypnotizing people, speaking not to their conscious, to their subconscious. Every one of us have a subconscious, and able to withdraw information from there 
that will shock every normal human being, which means every one of us, every one of us, if we are able to download the information from his subconscious, we're going to find information from previous lives in different languages, which means you can take a person that was born now in America, is 20 years old, you go back, you regret him, he's speaking, you're hypnotizing him and he's basically sleeping, and he's answering your question, and you lead him to certain dates in his life, and you can even take him to times before he was born, which means if he's 20 years old, you go to 1930. Sometimes you hear silence. Why? Because his soul wasn't in a body. There's no answer. Sometimes he speaks in a foreign language, Dutch, Yiddish, Arabic, and you ask him who are you, and he tells you his name from his previous life. And he speaks French or Arabic, and then when you bring him back to conscious, you show him the video, and he doesn't really know what he's talking about. You show him, look what he's saying. He says, oh, I don't know Arabic. I don't know what I'm saying. Now you don't know. But in your previous life, 80 years ago, when you lived in Baghdad, that's who you used to be. And it's very interesting because today, the scientific world uses hypnosis to catch criminals, to find one peop why people are obsessive for food. They can't stop eating. So they check in their previous life what's the reason for that, why people are afraid from airplanes. One Italian woman, she was afraid every time there was an airplane, she goes under the, under the bed. By, by hypnotizing her, they found out that she died from a bomb that were knocked on her home by the, by the wall, by the first or the second world war. That's how she died, from, a, from airplanes that came and attacked her town. So even in her new life, she's paranoid when she hears airplanes. Very interesting. I, I, this topic can be, you know, can, we can speak days and it won't be enough, but we will try to see as much as we can. Okay, let's move on. According to science, what, how we define death? How do we know when a person is dead? When he's in coma, is he dead? No, he's still alive. When a person doesn't have heartbeat, no heartbeat, no brain waves, no, the, the brain does not receive any more oxygen from the lung. Later, there's a drop in the body temperature, and then the fifth symptom is the person is completely numb, no feelings. You can burn him with a cigarette, you can pinch him, there's no response. Once you have all five symptoms for more than six minutes, six minutes, no brain waves, no heartbeat, no breath, no activity in the brain, no feelings. Once you have those symptoms for more than six minutes, this person is considered a complete dead person. However, we find out in this generation that there are too many exceptions to the rule. We have a rule and we have an exception to the rule. We have too many exceptions to the rules. How many? Just in the United States alone, 8 million people reported death and they return back to life. In the world, we have more than 30 million cases like this. Even though comparing it to 6.4 billion people that you have in the world, it's nothing. It's not even 1%. Still, the fact that tens of millions of people reported that they died and they returned back to life, and large portion of them died for much more than six minutes, such as 40 minutes, two hours, in India even two days. One person was dead for two days and returned back to life. And remember that according to the law of medicine and the scientific world, if a person is dead for more than six minutes, even if he returns back to life, he's supposed to be brain damaged. He should lose his memory and his brain cells are defected. But we find too many exceptions to the rule that people are waking up after half an hour, an hour sometimes, and they remember everything, and they are very emotional. They begin to cry and describe what happened to them. We're going to see some of the things that they are saying. Okay, those names, top names as I say. Dr. Raymond Moody is one of the most famous one in the world, a, psychi a doctor for psychiatry in Virginia University. Interview 150 people who died and came back to life. He wrote very, very famous books that were translated to 30 languages. 
He has very many, many websites. He's one of the most famous ones in the world. Uh, the psychologist Carlos Ossis from the United Union uh, of Psychology interviewed 877 doctors and he published books and articles. And Dr. Kenneth Ring, a psychologist from Connecticut University, 102 cases are brought in his books. Dr. George Ritchie, the president of Richmond Academy for Medicine and the uh, president of the, the psychiatry uh, section in Towers Hospitals. And uh, doc, the most famous in the world, the most famous in the world, Dr. Elizabeth Kovleros, the number one. More than 20 years, she investigated more than a thousand people who died and returned to life. She published articles and books and many other famous ones. Let's skip some of the list and move to the next part. Okay, let's see some of the mutual elements that people who died and returned to life, this is what they report. Now remember, we are talking about people from different cultures, different countries, different languages, different ages, different religions, different everything. There's no way to think that this is a conspiracy between millions of people all over the world. They made up a story. It's impossible. It's people from different cultures, different villages all over the world. And all of them, with no exception, describe the exact symptoms. Once the soul exits the body, this is what happened. Listen good. That you won't be surprised one day. Now you know what's going to happen here. So, uh, I'm going to read it from here because the screen is too small here. Okay, so they say it like this. First thing that happened when a person died, i give you an example. Let's say a person is getting choked now. How long it will take for him to die? 20, 30 seconds, he's dead. Eventually, the pain is gone. 20, 30 seconds, he feels horrible pain, he cannot breathe, becomes blue, and then all of a sudden, silent. What happened? That he doesn't move anymore. The soul exits the body. The first second that the soul exits the body, the body falls on the ground. So the person is flying like a balloon. You know how a balloon slowly, slowly rising to the ceiling? <coughs> That's what you see right away. The first thing you see, you see your body is on the floor, is completely helpless, and the soul is flying inside the room. And of course, you see all the people around are panicking. One guy is calling 911, somebody is crying, someone is screaming, call ambulance. But you are in a very peaceful feeling. Flying, you don't feel any more pain. So somebody who got shot, his pain was maybe a second or two, and that's it. He doesn't feel anything. He sees his body bleeding. Some of them were very panicking that they died. And they didn't want to die, so we're trying to grab the phone to call 911 to save themselves. But once you are a soul, you don't have any physics in you. No physical, no material. So you, no matter how much you're going to try to grab, you're not going to be able to move any material, because only material can push material. Once you're spiritual energy, what we call a soul, you cannot move physical objects. So the next step, they are entering a tunnel. In the beginning, the tunnel is very dark. As they flying in a valley into this tunnel, they see mutual circles. And they are flying right in the middle. They hear a very loud whistle. And they begin to see light. From the minute they see light, the light becomes brighter by the minute until they all describe that it's the strongest light they ever saw. One of them said that if you take all the lights in this world combined, it still won't reach the level of that line. This light covering the person from everywhere, they feel unbelievable feeling by staring at this light, and many of them reported that they started to have a conversation with this light. Now, this conversation that they had with the light is not like we have, words to words. It's all telepathy. Whatever you want to say, the light sent you a message right away as an answer to what you just said. 
So through telepathy, there is a complete, clear communication. Everything is clear 100% like it's here, but you do not have words like you have here and you hear sound. It's very interesting. Now remember, this is Jews and non-Jews. Even non-Jews report the same symptoms. Then they begin to see their relatives and friends that died before them flying around. They see all kinds of images. The interesting, interesting part is that those images look exactly spiritually. It's an image. It's exactly like the day of their death. That means if somebody died in an accident and he was all bleeding, they look at him and he has all blood around his chest. So they look exactly like the time of death. And it's grandmothers, it's friends from childhood, and so forth and so on. Then there is a movie a movie, they begin to see their entire life from the minute they were crawling on a rug as babies until the moment of death, it could be 30, 40, 50, 70 years, depending what age they are, they see their entire life in chronological order, not a regular film, by pictures, snaps, one after the other, millions of pictures in Unbelievable speed. They say, over there, there's no limitation. Over here, we are very limited in the amount of information we can could, we could record. But over there, it's the subconscious 100%. The conscious is very limited. The conscious only record what's really, really necessary for the moment. But every detail in the world around you is recorded in your subconscious. i give you an example of what I mean. A woman... She sees her husband coming from the bus stop, from the window. She sa she's staring at him, and he, he looks on the floor for about 10 minutes until he gets to the apartment. She asks him, hey, Moshe, can you describe to me everything you looked at the floor? I was, I was staring at you. I saw that you were reviewing everything on the floor. Can you, can you describe to me everything that you saw on the floor from the bus stops to, to here? So he, he told his wife, oh, you're crazy, I have nothing to do in my life by looking at the floor. Who cares about the floor? She said, but I'm telling you, I've been looking at you and I saw that you're staring at the floor. So I'm sorry, I've been thinking about the, what I had at work, what's going to be tonight, the lectures that you're going to give me tonight. I've been busy about, with different things. Five minutes later, she wants to hang a picture on the wall. She's looking around for nails, she can't find a nail. She said, you know where we can get nails here? Do you have maybe nails in your room, anything? She say, says to her, oh, wait a minute. I just saw a nail five minutes ago on the floor next to the bus stop. He runs downstairs and he brings the nail. Now, before when she asked him, can you describe one thing that you saw on the floor? He really couldn't. Thinking, he would try the thing until tomorrow. He won't remember that he saw that nail. If you ask him, he will swear on his life that he doesn't know. But what happened, as soon as she spoke about the picture, all of a sudden he now remembered the nail. The brain works in two different units. <clears throat> the unit that you use constantly, that's called conscious. Whatever you need for every second, automatically is in the front of the brain and it's always ready to come out in any second. Things that is not been so useful, that you may need it once in a lifetime, maybe in 10 years, is stored automatically in your subconscious. Now remember, Trillions of pieces of information are recorded in the brain every hour. Trillions every hour. There is no limit to how much the subconscious can record. That's why we call in Judaism the soul. The soul records everything you saw in all your previous lives. Every detail, every beep, every person hunking on the floor when you're in the middle of the class, you hear a siren passing by. Nobody pays attention to it. If we're going to hypnotize you, you will be able to describe the most irrelevant details that happens to you in the entire day. Everything. Who says what, the temperature in a room, a teacher that popped in the class for one second, things that you would know about. You remember everything. So this is how it goes. They saw their entire life from the minute they born until the time they died. All of them were able to hear and see everything that happens around their body. If the body is on the highway, they see the entire area, the police, the ambulance, everything. 
If they get to the hospital, once they are in the hospital, they are able to see what happened in the entire hospital. Every room, every floor, simultaneously. So that means if they are in this room, in this college, somebody died here in this room, when he's going to wake up in 10 minutes from now, he's going to tell us what happened in each class in this entire building. Is it possible to dream such a thing? Where is all the information come from? How would he know that in the next floor there are such and such students, and in the basement there's such and such, and the teacher is over here, and the parking is full, and what's on the ceiling of this building? How does he know? We have to explain this. We're going to see how. Then, here is some of the things they said. I'm going to have to skip most of it. I was up. I saw how they're working on my body. I saw how they connected the electric shots into my chest. I saw how my body is jumping on a surgery table. And all of a sudden, I was falling right back into my body, and I woke up. So one of them said, I heard how the bones inside my body are making all kinds of noises by the electric. You know how the bones are moving when they put the electric shocks? One says, I saw the doctors giving up on my life and I felt horrible. I didn't want to die. I was definitely out of my body. I knew there is a possibility I will return and there's a possibility I won't. Like I said, they felt very special spiritual feelings. Some of them say that the light asked them if they're ready to die. And some of them started to say, no, I have children, I have a wife, and they receive an answer everyone has. It's not a reason not to die. Some of them had a complete conversation. Some of them never got to the point of the conversation. They just saw the light and that's it. Some of them reported that there is a line that is very clear. Once you cross that line, there's no return. Before you cross that line, there's still a chance to return. Once you went beyond that line, it's clear to everybody that you cannot return. All of them reported that relatives came to welcome them. This is people that I knew from my life. I saw my grandmother and a kid from my school. I felt them present right around me. They're all flying around me. I saw them in my brain, not in my physical body, but I saw the fingers, the toes, everything. Let's see this. Personal story segment time, we get a special two-part series about what happens after we die. Is there an afterlife? Obviously a vital question. And most Americans believe there is. According to an ABC News poll, 90% of us say death is not the end. It certainly wasn't for Don Piper. He was pronounced clinically dead after a car crash back in 1989. Mr. Piper was even put in a body bag. What happened after that is an amazing book, a best-selling book, 90 minutes in heaven. I spoke with Mr. Piper a few days ago. So, Mr. Piper, when you're driving down a narrow lane, you see a tractor trailer coming dead at you, pick it up from there. Well, I was just head on. I had no idea. It was a narrow highway. I had no way to go. I was worried. It was really good to head on. It was such an uh, impact that uh, the wheels of the driver's side of the truck roll over my car, crushed me, and it shoved it under the railing of the bridge, and I was killed instantly. <coughs> when you say you were killed, you were just killed. So, I mean, what's the definition of you being killed? Well, it was a full car pileup, so uh, it, had, it had four sets of EMTs came out. The group location that kept on everybody. Nobody else is fine except me, so they all focused on me, and they all did all the tests at their disposal. They all uh, concluded the same thing. I was fatality. Uh, the body was coming up with a waterproof pot that we went in, and they waited for someone to come and take the body. They left the body. So you were actually covered in uh, head and toe, no breathing, hole, or anything. You're there. No. Yeah. no. So you're, according to these uh, medical people, done. Then what happens in your mind? What What is going on in your mind? Well, immediately I was standing uh, at some uh, magnificent gates, uh, surrounded by people I had known and loved in life. So when I saw them, I knew where I was because I, I knew where they were. I knew I was uh, at the gates of heaven. Now, when you saw people that you had known who had passed away before you, were they in human form, body form? Um, 
it, in a sense they were, they were all fully recognizable as themselves. So yes, I, they were tangible, I could see them. And uh, they were all perfect. Uh, many of them I had known in life had died in an elderly age or they were not traumatic accident themselves. Oh. But when I saw them, they were all ageless. But you said in your book you didn't see God or Jesus or anything like that. Uh, in the distance, uh, as I was approaching the gate, I was going to ask about the Jews. You might imagine there really are a lot of magnificent structures inside the gate. And at the pinnacle, uh, a great hill beyond them, is a bright, uh, bright light. I, I have to speak to you that that is where God, uh, and I was headed in that direction when suddenly I, I was returned to Earth. Now, how did that happen? You were returned to Earth how? What do you remember? Uh, all I remember is being at the gates and about to enter after a lot of other magnificent things that I saw and heard. Um, as it turns out, 90 minutes after the truck hit me, a man uh, climbed into the car and uh, because he felt like God spoke to him, he started praying over me even though he knew I was dead. Suddenly I found myself back in the car, under the tarp, in the dark. He's singing a hymn and he's making me sing it with him and I had no idea what had happened to me. What about a doctor or a scientist, somebody saying to you, look, uh, you had a head trauma, and when you have a head trauma, all things, and you were a believer for, you know, from the jump, I mean, very religious man, this was in your mind, uh, head trauma, hallucinations, it's real to you, but it isn't really real. Well, it's actually the most real thing that's ever happened to me. It now defines my reality here. I know that, that how temporary this is, and that we know we all know this guy, but I guess I'm this life alive. Well, I guess I, uh, the bottom line is, um, if somebody doesn't believe you, and right. you know, some people watching right now are not going to, is there right. anything you can do or say to make them believe? So this is a very remarkable, unique situation. Um, I saw things there that I wouldn't have expected to see if I was having a dream. Um, I saw people there that I didn't expect to see. There were a lot of things about my experience that uh, convinced me in no uncertain terms that that is reality. And, and this is fleeting. This is passive. I can't wait to go back there. I didn't want to come back here. Okay, as you saw, this is just one out of millions of these people that I reported. You can put the light back on. Many, many people who died and they returned and they describe what happened to them. The answer to the question that he asked him is basically, how do you know it's real? Maybe some people will think you're hallucinating. The answer should be, and he's, in this person's case, he wasn't in a hospital, but those people who died in a hospital, they say, if I was hallucinating, how exactly I know what happened in each room in a hospital? Hallucination will not tell you exact information in every floor in a hospital. Who died in what room, what number of the room, which doctor is operating in which room, how the, the, the top of the hospital looks, has nothing to do with hallucination. Hallucination is things that you had in your brain, like you're dreaming. So you see all kinds of pictures in a dream, that's probably for what you have left in your brain from the previous day or week. But you cannot hallucinate what's happened on the seventh floor in a hospital at the time that your body was laying there in the first floor in a hospital. So obviously, it's not a legitimate question. Here is one of the goyim, one of the non-Jews. This is what he had to say when he came back to life. I felt very embarrassed for many things that I saw. They showed me everything I did wrong. I thought, I wish I would have not done those things. I wish I could go back and, and correct them. Major disappointment that I did not do anything substantial in my life, I did not achieve anything, I do not know anything, I did not complete one thing. This is a non-Jew. For those who know a little bit Torah, the obligation of a Jew and a non-Jew, it's heaven and earth. There's nothing to compare. The non-Jews are only obligated to keep seven laws and they are righteous according to their test. Once they keep the seven laws and they die, they go to heaven for Gentiles. It's in a much lower level, spiritual level, but the test is very easy. However, Jews, they have a much harder mission here. The test is much harder, but the spiritual world that follows, it's in a much higher level. The test is harder, the reward is harder. Also, the punishment is harder. 
depends what's the obligation. If you're, obligation. if you're a doctor and you have to save life, and I'm not a doctor, and we're both in a room, and somebody got a heart attack, and we both sit and smoke cigars. Who's gonna get a bigger punishment, me or the doctor? The doctor. Why? He could save his life, it's his obligation. He signed, and the day that he became a doctor, he signed that no matter where he's gonna be, even on vacation, if there's a life risk, he must jump into the job, right? And that's basically how it works. Now, I would like to, I would like to go and continue basically to the next slide, and as I told you, some of the things I'm skipping because I would like to complete as much as I can. Okay, now, Dr. Elizabeth Kobler-Ross, she concludes, people who parts of their body are missing, someone who doesn't have an end, or he doesn't have a leg. First, it's very known that people who le lost a part of their body, they still have feelings. I knew once a guy without an arm and he said it's itching. Sometimes I feel itching in my arm, but he doesn't have an arm. Why? Because the soul is still complete. The soul looks like a complete body, spiritual. But the cover that covers the soul is cut. A, past a pure part of it is cut. So. Blind people, when they died, when they came back to life, they were able to describe everything that happened in this hour that they were dead in colors. In colors. Now, there are two kinds of blind people. Blind people who became blind in their life by an accident, or blind people that born blind. Now, you may think a person that was able to see and one day lost his vision. Somebody like this, he knows how to recognize color. So if he had an accident and his soul came out of the body, he knows what blue and what red. So he can describe what happened in colors. The interesting news is that people who were born blind never saw colors in this lifetime once. Obviously, if you take a blind person that born blind, you try to describe the color red to him until tomorrow. It's red, it looks like watermelon, it looks, what are you gonna say? He never saw red. He has no idea what you're talking about. Try to describe blue to him. You know, it's like the sky, it's like the ocean, it's very relaxing, it looks like uh, green. What are you gonna say? He doesn't know what you're talking about. Open the eyes of the blind for one second. Say here, this is red, this is blue, and close it. For the rest of his life, he will always know what it is. That's all he needs. He doesn't need more than that. Question is, how people who were born blind, they had an accident, their soul came out of the body, an hour later, they returned back to life, and now they begin to describe the color of the shirt of the doctor, the color of the car, all the colors, names, everything. How? If they're not supposed to know what it is. So that's an indication of previous lives. Because these people obviously could never learn colors unless if they learn it somewhere. And we all know that in this life they never saw colors. So that's an indication that these people recognize color from different life. But when they are in the body, their limitation is limit them like every other person. Once the soul goes out of the body, there's no more limitation. That's very interesting. They all describe it that once you're out of the body, you can see for very long. You can hear without limitation. Only the physical body limits the soul to certain limitations. Now, they all said, obviously, it cannot be a conspiracy because all these people begin to cry, they shiver, you know. It, it, everybody is not an actor. Everyone who just died in an accident cannot put a show. These people are emotionally, they begin to cry. So the final conclusion, the number one parapsychologist in the world, I know beyond any doubt, life continues after the physical death. Those who are open to hear will hear. And those who block their ears will be very surprised. There is no doubt whatsoever there is life after death. This is more or less what everybody else says with the researchers' final conclusion according to parapsychologists and scientific evidence, there is a spiritual 
image inside the physical body that is separated from the physical body in a time of death and remains somewhere. Where is this somewhere? Let's move on. Let's see what the Torah had to tell us. Now, everything I'm showing you, it's at least 2,000 years old. It was written some of it 2,000 years ago, but it was given all of it in Mount Sinai. When the Jews came out of Egypt, seven weeks later, God gathered us around Mount Sinai, which is around Jordan, and <clears throat> gave us the Torah, as I said before, in front of millions of witnesses. All the Jews, with no exception, heard the voice of God coming from heaven, from the mountain. Moses was speaking, God was answering him, and it's a fact that it happened. If you're not sure, just watch my DVD. I'm proving it scientifically over there in the first part. How do we know for sure that the Jews heard the voice of God? How do we know for sure that millions of people saw that God is giving Moshe the Torah? How do we know for sure? Not believing. Believing means not knowing in science. If you really want to follow something, you must know 100% that you're following the right thing. Now, this is what the Torah says. Rabbi Yosef, the son of Rabbi Yoshua, died. And when he returned to life, his father told him, what did you see in the upper world? He said, I saw everything is opposite from here. Those who are very important here in this life, they are not important at all in that life, in that world. And those who are not important here, nobody pays attention to them, are very important over there. It's not what we think here. What he means is, all the wealthy, famous people that you see in the media everywhere, which most of them, according to the Torah, are violating the rules. Many of them are Jews and they live like Goim. They can care less what God says in the Torah. They're ignoring the orders. They're very rich and famous here. Supposedly everyone is jealous with their life, no? Over there they are very miserable. After they die, they go over there, they are, they, they are completely the opposite of what they are here. And those people who are sitting in yeshiva and learn, nobody pays attention to them because they're poor, they cannot even afford a car, nobody pays attention to these people. All these righteous people in Israel, you go to Jerusalem, you see they're very poor, they hardly have food to eat. Nobody pays attention to them. You never hear about them in the media. They're very important over there. This is the way that the boy described it to his father. So his father told him, it's not an opposite world. That's the real world over there. Here it's opposite. That's what the Gemara brings in Masech Psachim, the Babylonian Talmud. Then the boy said one more thing. So when I got there, I heard a big echo that the people who came here with Torah knowledge are the luckiest. Ashrei, in Hebrew, this is how it sounds. Ashrei mi sheba lekan v'talmudo beyado. How lucky is a person that came here to my, life, to my world with knowledge in my Torah. This is what the boy announced. This is in the Talmud approximately 2,000 years ago. And another place in the Zohar, Kabbalah, Rabbi Krospadai, everyone was sure that he died. They checked him, no pulse, no nothing, he's dead. <coughs> then later, the, the, the Zohar didn't say how later, five minutes, five hours, we don't know. But later, he came back to life and started to describe the elevation of his soul to the upper world and the trial that he had. Some of the people already started to have a trial. There's one criminal in Israel his name is Avi Hajani. He used to be a gangster, robbing people, killing people, whatever you want. In one of the worst gangs in Pardes Katz in Israel. And he got stabbed in his heart three times. His heart was cut to three pieces. One of the biggest miracles in the medicine history. His case was published to all the hospitals in the world. One of the, the doctors couldn't believe that three months later he was able to walk back on his feet. When, they, when he went home, his father lives in the first floor. As he comes in a, in a dark evening, he comes home, somebody was hiding in a, in a hallway in the building, and just when he walked into the building, he stabbed him three times in his heart and escaped. And he screamed for about a few seconds. His father is right by the door, he opened up the door, he saw his son is dying, 
with his other brother, they took him right away to the hospital. From Pardes Katz to Bellinson is about 20 minutes ride. Obviously, you have to go in no entry, red light. You have no time to waste. So when they took him to Bellinson Hospital, uh, 45 minutes he was completely dead. There's a doctor that was just about to leave the hospital. On the way down to the parking, he saw that they arrived and he screamed to him. They saw a doctor walking with his case. They say, come on, hurry up, tell us what to do. And he saw that he's all bleeding in his heart. He knew it's a hard case. Right away, they took him to the emergency room. And then he was dead for 45 minutes. They already covered him. He was already on the way to the refrigerator. And then he came back to life. Now he made a tape what happened to him in these 45 minutes. Now everybody knows if you've ever been in Israel, it's a rule. Someone that his name is Avraham, in his entire lifetime, nobody will ever call him Avraham. How they call in Israel to someone that his name is Avraham? Avi. Avi, that's it. You go to school, Avi, Avi, your parents, Avi, your friends, Avi. It's like Stephen and Steve. Everyone call you Steve. No? <laughs> Just giving you an example. If somebody wants to pronounce your name correctly, how are they going to say Avram? That's Israeli accent. Avram. Nobody say Avraham. All of a sudden, this criminal hears. This is how he describes. Avraham. Avraham. With huge echo. Hundreds of times. Avraham. It doesn't, doesn't end. It's so, so loud. So you feel you freeze. You cannot move. It's only a soul. There's nobody. And then he's beginning to hear again, Avraham, Ham, Ham. Guess what? First question God asked him, why you shorten your name to Avi? Before he told him why you kill, why you rob. Now believe it or not, this person, after he came back to life, he promised that he's going to be fully religious and follow the laws. He did it only for three months. Three months later, he went back to be a gangster. And then he went to a construction site, and he fell from the second floor on his stomach on a pile of sand. He fell like this on his stomach, boom, the sand hit him in his chest, and he died again. It's the only person reported died twice. <laughs> twice he had the chance to return to life. Nobody understands why. Today he's already became a big rabbi, because he said from then he realized <laughs> once it wasn't enough. Once. Once he's married to have two, two chances, I don't know. But this is just to give you an example. He didn't even know what's going on. The first time in his life, somebody's calling me Abraham, Abraham. No one ever called me that name. Okay, now. Then this is what the Zohar says. When the soul exits this world, it enters the cave, which is the entrance to the next world. Three days after the exit from the body, the soul is still above the body and hoping to return. All seven days from the time of death, the soul is going back and forth from the house where the people see Shiva to the, to the graveyard, to the cemetery, back and forth. This is, by the way, all Jewish customs it's not that one day somebody came and said, you know what, I feel like, let's make a rule. Sit seven days on the floor, rip our clothes, don't take a shower. Why? Because one of your relatives died. Why seven? Why not three? One day it's enough. Why not a month? Maybe seven is not enough. Where all these customs came from? When you're beginning to learn ancient books, then you begin to see where everything comes from. So first thing, here now you understand why we sit Shiva. Why we sit seven days, we mourn on the dead, deceased person, because for seven days he has permission to still see what's happening here. And he's able to see which one of his sons is really sorry, and which one is counting his millions. The deceased person is able to see. Why we are still mourning for one year, we don't go to weddings, or don't listen to music, because the trial of the person continue for one year. That's why we say Kaddish for one year. Why not ten years? What, what, what's the problem? Anyway, I'm going to the synagogue. I say Kaddish forever. One year it's going to help. Why? Because the trial of every person is one year. Every beep that came out of his mouth, he's brought to justice. For good or for bad. Cannot avoid anything. The Torah says, there's an eye, there's an eye who watch over you. 
There is a year who listens to you, and everything you do is being registered in the book of God. This is right from the Torah. That means you cannot avoid anything. Every sin a person does in closed room, behind the scene, under the ground, no matter where he's going to try to hide, he can hide from his friends. He cannot hide from his Creator. And that's why we say Kaddish for one year, to try to help this person, which is helpless by now, because he obviously doesn't have any more free choice. He's dead already, and the only thing we can do is try to help him by saying Kaddish on him. Then the Gemara says, the Torah says, Ki lo irani adam vachai. No one can see me in his lifetime and stay alive, says God. And the Zohar says, there is nothing harder for the soul than the separation from the body. And a person doesn't die until he sees clearly the light of God. Remember, this is thousands of years ago, not in the parapsychologist generation. This is all at least 2,000 years old. And once the soul sees the light of God, it's anxious to stick to it. And out of anxiety to go out to that light, slowly he separates from his body. And when the time for the person came to die, he see the light of God. And the soul jumped out of the body towards that light. If he's righteous, eventually he gets glued into that light. This is all spiritual expression. Try to understand as much as you can. If he's wicked, the light will disappear eventually, and he will stay mourning for his fortune, for what's going to happen now. In the time of death, a person will get to see all the mysteries and the things he could not see and understand in his life. Why you missed the plane? why this woman didn't want to marry you, why uh, you had that sickness, why your friend died and you got saved, why, 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 there's millions of whys that we, we have right now, why you didn't get that, why this guy lied to you, why this guy stole your money, eh, so many maybes and why, why you missed the bus, eh, all these things that you are anxious to know and we don't know right now, over there everything will be clear. Then the world to come, it's endless. No borders, no limitations, no ceiling. It's wide open completely. It's huge light. There will be nothing like the light in this physical world. This is right here, one of the ancient books. All, this is all sources from Judaism. Now, another place. And the time a righteous person passed away, comes God to all the righteous people who passed away before him and gather all of them and say, go and welcome one more righteous Jew that come to this world. And they all come to him and say, come in peace. And when a person died, he gets permission to see his relatives that passed away before him. Relatives. And friends. Remember what these people said 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that they saw the relatives? This is 2,000 years ago. He sees his relatives and his friends, and he recognizes them, and they look exactly as they looked in their lifetime, 2,000 years ago, in the Torah. And they are happy for him, and they're welcoming him. And the Gemara says, when the president of Israel, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, he was the president of Israel in the time of the destruction of the second temple, when the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, he was the president. Moments before he died, he started to see things. And he told his student, run and get a fancy chair for the king of Judah, Hizkiyahu, because he's coming here to welcome me. He already saw that the king of Judah, one of the righteous people who came to he already was half in the body, half out of the body. This energy, what we call soul, leaves the body 30 days before the time of death. It begins to leave the body, slowly, slowly. Until the time of the death, the rest is coming out. When a person died, they show him his entire life. Remember, this is all, don't forget, at least 2,000 years old. This is what you did in that date and that time. Do you confirm it? 
And obviously over there you cannot lie, you cannot bribe the judge, and he has to say yes. And then they go to the next thing, and the next thing. And then he say, yes I did, yes I did. Just imagine how many times we're going to have to repeat, yes I did, yes I did. For all the things that they're going to show. Once he review everything he did, comes God to him and say, I want you to sign and confirm that this is your entire life. And this is all the sins you made. And the person has no choice, he signs and confirms. And here is what I told you before, Da male male mimcha. Always be aware what's above you. There's an eye who watch you, an ear who listens to you, and everything you do is being registered in a book of God. Then another source, in the Gemara, in the Talmud. Everything you say in front of the dead person, he knows until the, the body is covered completely with sand. As long as the grave is open, he sees everything out. Who's crying, who's screaming in a seminary, everything he sees. Once they cover, some of the things he can still see, some he cannot see. Until the worms finishing to eat the entire body, worm, the snakes, the rats, you have no idea what happened to the body after it's buried. You come the next day to open the grave, you won't believe what's happened. Holes all over, it's horrible. I knew a guy that once I brought him to the yeshiva, I used to bury dead people. One time they had to move, they made a mistake. They buried somebody in the wrong grave, they had to move it. Only 24 hours later, half of the face was eaten already by the snakes. Snakes under the ground. They get to the bodies. Very scary. So, this is what the Gemara says. Amarav le Rav Shmuel Bar Shilat. Two rabbis used to learn together. They were old. So one of them, his name is Rav, he said to Rav Shmuel Bar Shilat, he says to him like this, In the time of my death, make sure you make me the best eulogy. Brings all the good things I said in my, I did in my life for all the people. Because I'm going to stand right above you and listen to everything you're going to say. This is 2,000 years old. Remember, everything I showed you, it's from our generation. This is 2,000 years ago. So you see the Torah knew everything we discovered in the last 20 years. It's all 100% in the Torah that we received 3,320 years ago. Some, I'm going to skip some of the things. What does it mean medium? There are ways to communicate with dead people through a medium. There are people who can relax 100% and they go into some kind of sleeping mode. And then you begin to ask them to speak, to call the soul of another person. And then these people begin to talk. And you are able to speak to a person who is dead through the mouth of that person. It's very interesting. The source to this, it's in the, in the Tanakh. King Saul was very nervous because it's going to be a big war tomorrow with Amalek. Was very nervous because he knew it could be a disaster. And he went to a woman and she called the soul of Samuel, the prophet. And only after Samuel, the prophet, came, the woman realized that this is King Saul with a custom. He didn't want anyone to know that he's going to her. And, King, and prophet Samuel told him, it's in the Tanakh, you can read it. Why did you get me upset to return me to this world? Where was Samuel? <coughs> Here is a proof that people exist somewhere. The fact that the Torah said don't call the dead people, don't ask them questions, obviously they exist. I'm sure all of you heard about people who died and they came in a dream to people. I have a case, I went to New Jersey, to Fairland, New Jersey, I gave a lecture, I became friendly with a couple that used to be very, very anti-religion. They hated religion so much that they formed a, a labor, in a, a, a party in the Knesset, in Israel, called Shinui. Shinui was anti-religion. Tommy Lapid was a guy that is against religion, all over the television. They brought him in. And then they had a goal to destroy the religion. They destroyed everything, Shabbos, everything. Until they met me, and of course I, go, I work scientifically, so they, don't have no, they have no one, nothing to answer. We went another one and another session. Slowly, slowly they became religious. They knew they saw the truth. 
One thing about these people, they are honest. When they thought that religion is nonsense, they fought against this with all their energy. When they realized they made a mistake, they became the, the complete opposite. No pride, nothing. They eliminated all their nonsense and started to become ultra-Orthodox. One time the woman comes to me and says, listen, my father one day went to Romania. She's an Ashkenazi woman, this woman from Romania. And one day my father went to Romania and disappeared. We never saw him again. We were sure that he cheated on my mother and left with his mistress to Romania and I hated him so much. One time we heard that he died in Romania and I never said Shiva on him. Now I'm religious, what should I do? I told her, listen, there's nothing you can do on him now. But here is what you're going to do. We have people in the yeshiva that say Kaddish for the dead people. Since nobody ever said Kaddish for him, you give a little money every month to one of the poor guys in the yeshiva and he's going to say, you nominate him to say Kaddish from morning to evening after learning Torah and that's the best you can do. Two months later, Friday, 11 o'clock in the morning, I never forget this. I get a phone call from her. I pick up the phone, she's shivering on the phone, crying, nervous, cannot understand what she said. Don't ask. My father came to me in a dream now. And he's all, you're saving me, don't stop, thank you very much for what you've done for me. Now why did he turn in the end? The poor, the poor guy, no mistress, no cheating, no nothing. He was a Mossad agent. He was working for the Israeli Mossad and Ceausescu over there, put him in prison, and he died in prison. They don't tell anyone, there's no Red Cross, you know the communists, how they were. They just put him in a hole somewhere, and he got sick, and he died. They never told anyone what happened to him. They never called Israel, we arrested somebody. They just took him, they put him in prison for who knows how many years, and he died. And for many years, they were sure that he betrayed his kids and just left Israel. This is just an example how many years later, he was dead already for many years. She started two months. They said Kaddish on him in yeshiva, and he came in her dream. She's all like, you see, this is the power of the Kaddish for the soul. Now, there are people who received information from souls of this deceased people. In the middle of a medium of a seance, they hold the pen, it's automatic writing, they hold the pen, not like a normal person, they just hold the pen like this. And after a few minutes, the pen begins to move. And the pen's right. One of them is Rosemary Brown. She's a medium, American. She has no knowledge in music whatsoever. Never learned music in her life. When she goes into medium, into sleeping mode, she begins to write the most famous music in history. Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Bach. Perfect music. The spirits of these people coming and moving her hand to write their famous music. When they look at that, this is a, this is a picture of what she was writing. She doesn't know anything about music. Emma Conti, an Italian woman, she also has this power to go into trance. She received music from the spirit of the songwriters Emily Dickinson. She won 46 awards for the music that she wrote, even though she never went to high school. She's very complete ignorant. She falls into trance, she begins to write music, and she wins all the awards for her music. Why? It's not her. It's the spirit of Emily Dickinson writing the songs for her. She doesn't know anything. She said, I don't know anything about music. It's not me. It's Emily Dinkinson. Okay, I'm skipping. Let's go a little bit to reincarnation. There are people in the world who remember their previous life. Remember, there's a rule and there's an exception to the rule. It's very interesting. In Israel, you have the Druze. It's not really complete Arabs. They go to the Israeli army. They're faithful to Israel. The Druze. And there's, there are many, many Druze Arabs that remember their previous lives in detail. There is, I have a whole movie about a Druze kid that remembers his entire life as an Israeli soldier that died in Lebanon. When he, was for, when he was 44, he was in the reserve. The building collapsed on his head. And he died and he returned back in the next village in Israel. 
And he was, when he was three years old, he started to tell his father, as, as, all the time. That's the only word he say, as. They check around, what's as? They don't know what's as. In the end, it turns that one day when he was seven, he tells his father, take me to my wife, seven years old. I want to go visit my wife. What wife? Don't worry. I'll give you direction how to go. Drive here, go here. They go into the village. They go into the house. They bought a camera. He goes inside. There's about 43 years old woman, Arab woman. He says, hi, I'm your husband, <laughs> seven years old. It's not a joke. Bring the family album. This is Ahmed. This is Muhammad. This is Saeed. This is Mustafa. He knows all the people from the previous life. This is my cousin. This is it. I was playing volleyball in a team. I died in Lebanon. I called you two days before. Wait a minute. He goes to the attic. He brings a bag full of letters. And he says, before we take the letters out, he says to the television reporter, he says, I'm going to tell you my serial number as a soldier. There are seven digits, he remember five. He didn't remember the last two. Five out of seven, he remembered. It was a few years ago. And all the letters he wrote to her. And then he opened the closet, he showed his uniform, she still kept it. So now they're showing him in Israeli prime time. And you know, they're not crazy about religion, but they agree to show it because it's authentic. And then in the end of the article, they show him standing next to his grave, seven years old, crying. So the woman asking him, what do you feel? He said, very weird. I look at my grave, you know. But he remembers his entire previous life. Then they show him sitting with his cousin. And they think, you remember how we used to dance with the ladies in the nightclub that night? We drank beer. You, you were dizzy. Seven years old. This is one out of many cases in Israel. But you have cases like this all over the world. I'm going to show you one soon. But... But I'm skipping some. I just give you one, one story. The rest you can watch in my website. There's many, many stories over there. The person names is Indika Conreta from Sri Lanka, was born in 1962. Ian Stevenson, the number one investigator to reincarnation, he started to check his case in 1968, six years after he was born and published his conclusion in ASPR in 1974, in a newspaper. Indica started to talk when he was two years old. A year later, he started to describe his life as a wealthy person in a city of Matara in Sri Lanka. I have a mansion, a Mercedes, elephants in my backyard. I have a servant, his name is Parmedaza. And he's my private chauffeur, three years old. He described his life as a very rich guy. His father sent Stevenson. Stevenson went to that city, and he found the mansion, and the elephants, and the servant, and the Mercedes, everything he described. And he went to him, and he asked him, what was, what was your boss name? Exactly like the boy said. It, apparently, he used to be a businessman that's selling wood. You know, wood, they chop woods, and he sell, he makes a lot of money. Now he died, and he returned in the same country, Sri Lanka, but in a different house. Dr. Stevenson confirmed all the information that he gave. Let's give you another example. Shanti, born in Delhi, in India, 1926. Age three, she started to describe the city of Matra. She say, I have a husband, his name is Kaider Nat. She's three years old. And I died ten days after I gave birth to my son. When Shanti became nine years old, she remembered clearly her entire previous life. Her parents sent messengers to the city of Matra and they found that Kaider Knight is still alive, her husband. They wrote him a letter and they told him about the hallucination of their daughter. Kaider was very impressed from the details. One day he showed up surprisingly into their doors. They open up the door right away. The nine years old girl say, Kaider, right away. <laughs> she started to tell him all the food she used to cook for him. And then she looked at him angry and said, why did you get remarried? Didn't we make an agreement that we'll never get remarried if one of us will die? <coughs> you never kept your promise. Kaider was very embarrassed. 
They took three famous people from India, a lawyer and a newspaper editor and another one, and they went with her to the city of Matra to follow her. Remember, there was no video camera like today. It was 1926. They follow her. As soon as they got to the train station, there were hundreds of people standing in a crowd. In a crowd, she recognized her brother-in-law in a crowd. Gita, his name. And then the carriage with the horse, she gave them direction into the house. She recognized the entire village. When they got to the house, she knew all the rooms. She recognized the house even if he renovated from the outside. She recognized the house. She knew all the rooms and then she went to one of the rooms and she said, dig in the ground. They started to dig and dig and then she looks at him and she said, where is the money that I put here? It's gone. So he said, after she died, I took the money from there. So she remembered all her previous life. This is one of many, many cases that we have even today, kids that remember their previous life. I will show you what I'm talking about. Here is a movie, I just hope that the sound is not so, so loud here. Usually I connect it to a speaker. Let's hope that you're gonna hear it. There are thousands of stories like this, and Dr. Jim Tucker has gathered many of them. We're investigating cases of very young children who spontaneously begin talking about previous lives. Uh, they usually begin between the ages of two and three and, and continue until the age of five or six. Uh, we're looking at these cases to learn as much as possible about this phenomenon. Jim Tucker is preparing a research trip to meet one of his subjects. I don't know what's this black. Claiming to remember his past life. Gus Ortega is a little boy in Colorado who has talked about being his grandfather. Uh, this began when he was 18 months old and he's made a number of statements that seem quite specific. This one uh, is a stronger case because the child has made some very specific statements that seems very unlikely he could have heard through normal means. Gus Ortega's case is only one of many. We've been studying these cases for the last 40 years. We've now collected over 2,700 cases like this. These cases have been found all over in Asia in West Africa, they've been found in South America, in Europe, and the United States, pretty much wherever they've been looked for. In a place not quite that far away, a hospital in America. An old man is dying. young boy believes he is this man reborn. Gus Ortega is a normal six-year-old. Like most boys, he cherishes his time with his dad. But this relationship is different. Gus remembers that he played with his dad in a previous life. Only then, he was the father, and his dad was his son. This is the case that UVA scientist Jim Tucker is investigating. Whenever I go to see a case, I go with a certain amount of skepticism. I never go with the assumption that this is reincarnation. And that's also the same approach that I have with, with the work as a whole. We're here because this is an interesting phenomenon, so we're trying to learn as much about it as possible. His son Ron found him lying on the floor in his home. A stroke. Grandpa Augie died five hours later. He was a shopkeeper. He sold everything people wanted to buy, and he loved his family. But he never met his grandson, Gus. And Gus was born one year after Grandpa Augie's death. One day, when he was just a year and a half, Gus was alone in his room with his father. Ron came out and told me that he had just finished changing uh, Augie's diaper and that he, that he looked right up at him and said, you know, Dad, when I was your age, I used to change your diaper. I was flabbergasted. 
be honest with you. I thought it was just kind of strange, especially the choice of words uh, to say that phrase, when I was your age, for his, this little one and a half year old toddler. He started talking about grandpa and, you know, just the little things he was saying um, that we knew he couldn't have known because he never met grandpa. His grandfather died a year before he was born. So, um, yeah, we were pretty puzzled about it. And then one day, Ronald Tega brought a set of old photos home and something even more remarkable occurred. And I said, oh, look, here's a, look at this old photograph. And he came up to it and he goes, oh, there's me. I mean, I was like, just totally astounded, you know. Uh, it just stopped me, you know, cold. I mean, because how would he know that? Gus would make more statements like that over the course of the next years. He would recollect episodes of his grandfather's life that even Ron could hardly remember. And he was there. Gus knew more about his grandfather than he should have. Is this evidence of reincarnation? How else can these children remember another life? The case files of Dr. Jim Tucker will yield more clues. As you saw, this is only one of many, many stories. Time is out, so I ran out of time. But I, just to give you an update, I didn't even finish half of this lecture. I have spiritual pictures that camera lens detect in the air, in space, all kinds of images of souls of people that are flying in space that the frequency of a normal eye cannot detect, but the lens of the camera can see and they were checked by laboratories. If you want to see the rest of the lecture, which is it's getting better by the minute, divineinformation.com. Just remember that after this movie, many more good things coming. We don't have time for that anyway, so time, time runs out. But if you have any questions so far, I give five minutes for questions and answers. Yes? Um, you said, so there are many times that people come back like in different bodies, the right. souls come back. So that means us here, we don't have our own personal soul. It's someone else's soul? No, no, no. It's the same soul all the time. The same soul all the time, but the same soul transferred to different bodies. So for instance,